Manufacturing human insulin. So the first question to ask is, why would you do it? Um, the main reason is that making human insulin is cheaper um, than using alternatives such as pig insulin. You have no rejection issues and it's more effective, along with not having any of the um, cultural and um, potential religious issues with using pig insulin. So this is what the syllabus requires you to be able to do. Um, basically, you have to be able to identify the steps of how you do it and then talk about the advantages and disadvantages of it. So, step one, identifying the human insulin gene. Well, that's straightforward nowadays. Following the Human Genome Project, the human insulin gene sequence is fully known. Um, but actually, the human insulin gene itself is gained by taking a cell out of the pancreas, so one cell out of the pancreas, and looking for an mRNA transcript. Um, and that is how we isolate the human insulin gene. Um, so, if we're using mRNA as our starting point, we need to turn it into cDNA, and we do that using reverse transcriptase. So here we have our pancreas, the islet of Langerhans cell, the um, mRNA is easily isolated from that as it's an insulin secreting cell. It will have lots of um, mRNA transcripts of that gene. But obviously the mRNA is single-stranded and it's RNA, not DNA. So we need to find a way of making DNA. The enzyme reverse transcriptase jumps onto the mRNA transcript and trundles along it dong, 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 like this. And as it's doing that, it creates a single um, strand which is cDNA, okay? And this cDNA is then polymerized using um, DNA polymerase. So the cDNA is then copied um, like, like normal to make a single, a double strand of um, DNA, and that in turn is made into two, and then four, and then eight, using something called the polymerase chain reaction, which can multiply a strand of DNA very, very quickly. Once you have the gene, we need to find a way of getting it into the bacterium, and that is where we use a vector, and the vector is a plasmid. Here is a bacterial plasmid, um, and it's the one that's used in this process. And the bacterial plasmid has two antibiotic resistance genes. One is for tetracycline, and one is for ampicillin. Now what's interesting is this point here, which is a restriction enzyme cutting point, um, which will open up the plasmid to enable the piece of DNA to be inserted into it, and that breaks the tetracycline resistance gene. So any recombinant plasmid will not be resistant to tetracycline. So the recombinant plasmid is formed fairly easily. Um, the DNA is inserted into the plasmid here, and then the gaps are stuck together with DNA ligase to make a complete recombinant plasmid. When this is done, there are three possible outcomes. You could have just the normal plasmid that just reseals itself. You could have the gene, which makes like a kind of little mini plasmid. Or you could have what you want, which is the actual recombinant plasmid. At this point, there's no way of identifying which bit is which. Um, that is done once it's been taken up by the bacteria to insert the plasmid vector into the bacterium, um, and that is done in a process called transformation. First of all, the bacteria are put into calcium chloride, um, which makes the cell wall permeable, um, and that is called making the cell competent. And then, either through electroporation or heat shock, um, the plasmids are then taken up into the cell. And the rate that that's done at is called the transformation rate. Then it is time to identify the modified bacterium using the antibiotic resistance gene. So following the transformation progress, um, process, you are going to have four possible outcomes. You will have a cell that has taken up a plasmid with no um, human DNA in it. You have a cell which has taken up the recombinant plasmid. You have a cell which has taken up the little mini gene. And you'll have a cell which has taken up uh, no gene at all. So we can look at the relative resistance. This uh, one here will be resistant to both ampicillin and tetracycline. 
This one will be resistant to ampicillin, but not tetracycline, because the tetracycline cutting point, the answer restriction enzyme cutting point was in the middle of the tetracycline gene. Um, that will be resistant to neither, because it doesn't have any of the resistance in the plasma, and this one will be resistant to neither. Consequently, you can use um, the, the antibiotics to isolate the bacterium that you want. So first of all, your culture is grown on an ampicillin plate and colonies will appear. Now the only colonies that will, the only bacterium that will be able to grow on this are bacterium that have taken up a plasmid. At this point you don't know whether it is um, the recombinant plasmid or just the um, non-recombinant plasmid. What is then done is a process of replica plating where a sponge is basically used to pick up the colonies and transfer them to the next plate, the tetracycline plate. And then only some of the colonies will grow. What you can then do is you can look back at the original plate and you can see which colonies didn't grow on the tetracycline plate. So that's that colony, that colony and that colony. And those must be the recombinant colonies. And so they can be isolated and um, grown up in the fermenters. So the bacteria will um, be grown in the fermenters, just like the fermenters that you learned about in the biotech chapter, and then insulin will be removed and purified before being packaged for distribution. It's important that when the gene is transferred to the plasmid, it isn't just the gene alone, but it is, there is also a promoter on it. The reason for this is that the RNA polymerase has to attach on the promoter, okay, and it's from there that it then moves to transcribe the gene. If you don't have the promoter, then there's no way for the RNA polymerase to bind, and so the gene will not be transcribed.